Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And so this is a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time and this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Hey everybody, it's March already, and here at Rotary Nature Center Friends in Lakeside Park, we are celebrating a new anniversary of the Lake Merritt Wildlife Refuge. It is the 153rd anniversary, and thanks to our partners at the Lake Merritt Institute, we'll soon have a new banner up at the Fairyland entrance of the park. Today, we're going to focus on some mysterious visitors to Lake Merritt in the past three months, uh, the Chinook salmon. The program today focuses on the salmon that came to visit Lake Merritt in the past three months. It began in October when people noticed dead fish floating in the lake. Greetings from the Trestle Glen outfall. I'm over here uh, just cleaning the lake, found a soccer ball, you know, I'm getting a bunch of stuff out of the lake. But way more importantly, we found another little buddy over here. We have salmon, a, a dead salmon that's been hanging out over at the Trestle Glen outfall. So very exciting stuff. Now we have salmon that are being found near the Glen Echo Creek outfall and now the Trestle Glen. Concerns were raised that we were going to see uh, fish kills as have been observed in the past because of high levels of pollution. Later, we began to see swimming live fish in the lake and more questions were raised. Here are two fish that uh, the Lake Merritt Institute volunteers observed in Glen, Glen Echo Creek. You guys are great, you got over the top. Yeah. It took a long trip to get here. Welcome to the Merritt, Lake Merritt. Echo, Echo Glen Creek. At first, we didn't know what type of fish we were dealing with. So we went to the East Bay Regional Parks for some advice. And, um, and Dee Rosario introduced me to their fish biologist, um, Joe Sullivan, who came out to take a look at the fish. Um, and he referred us to um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, biologist, Emily Jacinto Kim, who came all the way out from Fairfield to examine one of the fish that washed up in Lake Merritt. All right, uh, I'm Emily Jacinto with CDFW. So we're gonna measure the length first. 67. Has its adipose fin. We'll take a fin clip and we'll take the otoliths. Tell us a little bit of what, what information could be gotten from the Ololith 
Yeah, so you could, they grow like rings in a tree, so you can get age and you can see how much time species spent in the salt water versus fresh water. And then if you do an analysis of the chemicals that are in the otolith, you can potentially tell what creek they came from originally. So when they were born in a creek, went out to the ocean and then are now here. So is there a chance that these otoliths could be analyzed? Yeah. Fantastic. I'm like, where are you, buddy? There you go. The appearance of the salmon gave us an opening into finding out more about the lake and also providing opportunities for young people to become science stewards of the lake. So here we have students from St. Paul's um, school explaining how the salmon are being frustrated by blockages in the watershed. Uh, hello, uh, we are both from St. Paul's and we'll be talking about spawns. So the reason why um, salmon are coming from the lake is because the lake is they're all in this area and so spawners come up to this area and all up here because they can't lay any of their eggs here anymore because they've all been built over. Um, um, and the reason they're coming to Lake Mara is because they're trying to get to the creeks that aren't covered over, like in the hills. And so they need to travel like upstream through creeks that are covered over to get there. And some creeks have little areas, so like Glen Echo, there's a lot over by the Glen Echo Arm. And so spawners are going through Lake Merritt to lay their eggs in the open creeks. Next, we have some high school students who came out to test the water in Glen Echo Creek to see if it would be suitable for uh, salmon fry. Hi, um, this, uh, we're apart from Holy Names High School and I am Liza, this is V, and this is Sophia, and then there's V's dad. Um, uh, so we're here testing the pH level and the salinity and the oxygen inside of the level to see if salmon can live here. Um, we're testing to see if um, salmon can swim up here and have babies from near Lake Merritt and if this place is breedable. Can you give us a preliminary finding? Can you read out what you found? Um, well, from like Glen Echo Creek, we found that the oxygen was 5.5, the pH was 7.5, and the sand salinity was 5. Yeah. Very interesting. So what do we have to do now? Um, I don't know. Maybe like run more tests to see if we can really make sure that it's a place that they can be. Thank you. Spoken like a scientist. Thank you. Thank you, student scientists, and for your stewardship and for um, caring about habitats and salmon and Lake Merritt. It's just been a wonderful opportunity, the salmon arriving here, an opening into learning more um, on the part of um, young people and older people, and just a fascinating thing to see in the heart of an urban area. So at this point, I would like to introduce our featured guest tonight, Dr. Brian Ali. Um, Dr. Brian Ali is um, a senior fisheries biologist um, with an extraordinary um, bio. I sent everybody a small taste of it, but um, in researching, I, I, there are some interesting things I learned. Uh, first of all, he, um, he it was a San Francisco native, he was born there, but he grew up in Oakland and he attended Oakland schools and graduated from um, Oakland Technical High School. Um, he went on to get his a PhD and his um, bachelor's degree in zoology at UC Berkeley and a PhD in um, fishery science at um, the University of Washington. Um, he worked has worked in the fisheries um, in the Sea Grant program. Um, for his career, and, but he began, interestingly, working um, in the uh, Olympic Peninsula with the Quinault Indian Nation, um, working on some of their um, 
there are problems with um, salmon and access to salmon um, as um, as Native peoples' rights to um, to those resources uh, as established by treaty. And so he has had just a very uh, rich and interesting background. I don't want to um, hold up too long because uh, I could talk all hour about all the things that he has done. But um, we are so privileged to have you, um, Dr. Lee, and um, we look forward to um, being able to, to hear your talk and ask questions and so forth. So are you ready to get started? Sure, just one second, I'll uh, get this up and going here. Perfect. Uh, can everybody see that? Yes. And you can hear me? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's a real pleasure for uh, me to speak to you tonight as a, an Oakland uh, person. And uh, <laughs> I grew up in Oakland and uh, Lake Merritt uh, was a, uh, a real pleasure to be around and to look at and had some disastrous sailing experiences <laughs> in an El Toro sailboat, but uh, uh, the winds can be kind of wicked in there. And um, But anyway, I'd like to talk to you tonight, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Katie and, and others. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about salmon, and uh, we can take a uh, question and answer break after a few of the slides, and then I'll go on if that's okay. Uh, so I'll just uh, get started here. Um, I have a, a larger PowerPoint that has a number of points, but I'll try and concentrate on a few. There are three main characteristics of the salmon, Pacific salmon species uh, that we'd like to talk about. One is anadromy. Um, and uh, this is a, a cartoon that amuses me. Hopefully it does you. Um, <clears throat> this uh, basically shows uh, people coming down the escalator and there's one guy that's going against it, Bob, and he said he was, they said he was raised in the wilderness by salmon. So salmon go against the flow as adult fish. And um, uh, sometimes that's a good thing in life to go against the flow. But for salmon, it works. And it's, it's a uh, secret to sustainability. It's the reason, of course, that you uh, have received salmon um, and they blessed you to come up into Lake Merritt and to Glen Echo Creek, as we have seen. Uh, they're attracted to flow. They were attracted to the water, uh, leaving Lake Merritt uh, through the tide gates. Uh, for salmon, it's all about flow. And, um, and you can uh, guide them uh, once they get back to their natal streams uh, by flow fish ladders uh, that, that are required to get fish above barriers, natural barriers, um, use that concept um, to attract them with flow. And, that, and that's important. So all salmon spawn in fresh water, but they migrate to the ocean to uh, achieve their final size. And this is a major a strategy on behalf of salmon. And there's a, a major school of thought that salmon evolved from rainbow trout um, after the Pleistocene uh, ice sheets have melted. And um, so this concept of anadromy then was um, those fish that genetically uh, and environmentally found an opportunity to go downstream uh, and it was connected to the ocean uh, would go out to a richer pasture. They'd come back as larger fish 
and anatomy means they're required to come back into fresh water to spawn. So they're born in fresh water, they rear in fresh water, they go to the ocean, get this final size and come back to fresh water. That's anadromy, and that's a major um, a life history pattern that promotes um, the survival of the fittest. That is to say, you go out in the ocean, come back at a larger size, um, and you have uh, a large size fish has more eggs. In fisheries, we call that fecundity. And uh, Chinook salmon have roughly 5,000 eggs on average, could be larger. Um, larger egg size and more nutrient rich. So it has uh, nitrogen infused, uh, marine nitrogen. Uh, it's bringing home from the ocean, which is a wonderful concept, larger egg size, and it's a competitive advantage to do that because those fish that leave more offspring in the next generation is basically what uh, natural selection is all about and what survival of the fittest is all about when you boil it down. So the life history characteristics in this little um, cartoon that was made uh, in Alaska for, for a hatchery is they come in to the freshwater streams. Uh, the female digs the red, chooses the male. Uh, basically the male and female have external fertilization. The eggs are in the gravel, so they're incubated. Uh, in a hatchery, they're incubated in incubators. They rear in the system for a period of time, depending on the species. Uh, they migrate downstream and go to the ocean. Uh, they mature in the ocean. They uh, use um, the electrical field uh, around the Earth's surface to find their way back to the ocean, to the river mouth. And then they use chemical olfaction or smell to find their way back. Uh, so that's the life history, and it's different for each uh, species. Whoops, I'm sorry, excuse me. This is what I'm trying to do. Here we are, we have these cute little larval, larval salmon. We call them alevins, A-L-E-V-I-N-S. -E um, they have this yolk sac, and that's their nutrient base while they're in the gravel. So they're between the gravel inner spaces uh, and uh, they do very well. They get oxygen in a good, re uh, in a good uh, environment uh, where uh, gravel, uh, the w uh, oxygen travels through the gravel, brings them oxygen for respiration and uh, and doesn't get a lot of, of fine sand and silt filling up the gravel spaces because then it would entomb them and the low survival that results from that seriously impairs production. So these little guys have essentially a lunch pail. There's only enough energy uh, to survive during the time they're in in the gravel, which is about two months. So Chinook salmon should be out now in streams uh, if, if there's production going on. And then they will rear in the stream for a period of time, but they have to come up through the gravel. And the female, she buries the eggs in the gravel. She digs with her tail and Chinook salmon are very large and they're strong and they can move gravel around kind of like a bulldozer. <clears throat> and that's a form of parental care. And uh, uh, so they're in this nest, this red, R-E-D-D -D it's called, and they emerge vertically 
um, when that yolk sac is gone. And an interesting thing about salmon, some species require um, this, this tactile stimulation, uh, like they're laying against the rock. So in a hatchery, you have to provide them with a substrate. If you don't do that, they will swim and move, they're uncomfortable, so they're swimming and they're utilizing that yolk sac and they'll emerge from the gravel emaciated and won't survive. So- um, Dr. Lee, um, maybe we could pause for questions in a few minutes. I, I, um, in, I like in, in a, a minute or so- That's time. good, thank you very much. You're a good so, gate, gatekeeper. I, I, we, we had an arrangement where I was gonna do this. So uh, I wanted oh. to, um, to um, tell the audience that if you would type some questions into the chat, um, we could um, we could take the questions out of chat uh, for Dr. Lee right now. And um, we have a question. Are the conditions in Glen Echo Creek suitable for salmon or to not only visit, but also to spawn? That's the question. Uh, Echo Glen Creek, you say? Glen Echo, Glen Echo. It's Glen Echo, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, uh, well, the problem is what I heard the students say, I believe, is that the, the dissolved oxygen level was five. And uh, basically uh, three is lethal. Uh, five is uh, okay, I guess. It's a function of temperature, high temperature, lower oxygen. It's an inverse relationship. Um, uh, seven is preferred, uh, and nine, 10, and 11 is saturated de depending on the temperature. So uh, besides water quality, it uh, has to have adequate gravel, quality gravel to dig the red, and for the salmon to survive in the gravel. So those are some uh, things that are, are necessary. It wasn't looking good, but um, you know, maybe more data could be gathered. Um, yeah, it, it, oh. it'll probably vary by time of day. Uh, it'll, <clears throat> it'll vary by time of year and temperature of the water. So it needs to be taken, it's best to take three samples, take an average, mm -hmm. and then when you're doing point samples and then uh, kind of do it at different times of the day and do it different seasons. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention at this point that um, there's a program, there are uh, classrooms throughout California that are receiving um, rainbow trout and a little bit later steelhead eggs um, so the students can follow their development in the classroom and then release them in the wild. And I remember as a teacher watching the uh, salmon, the, the eggs, um, the rainbow trout eggs, um, hatch and then at some point they would swim up out of the gravel as you just described it was just um, brought that back memory we had another question popping up here could somebody um, feel that okay do chinook salmon eat along their journey up to their breeding uh up their breeding stream i asked clinton i'm sorry could you repeat that Kenny? i'm sorry do the salmon eat uh, while they journey up the stream to spawn Generally speaking, they do not, but they're attracted. Uh, and these uh, adult fish, this is a, an adult ch chum salmon. It's a male, uh, it's very colorful um, and uh, very attractive, uh, I think. And they uh, are aggressive and they will go after <coughs> eggs. They like the smell of eggs, obviously. Uh, but they also will go after different colors um, and people can, uh, under certain circumstances, uh, snag them uh, and that sort of thing. But generally speaking, their main focus is spawning. And so essentially they're uh, going through um, senescence, they're dying, and they're just one large gonad. 
and uh, all they want to do is spawn. And uh, this male wants to uh, find a female and be selected. And uh, the male has been uh, through sexual selection, natural selection has developed this uh, beautiful nose that's curled over into a kite and has teeth. And I, I think he thinks he's uh, quite attractive um, and that sort of thing. And then it depends on the female, of course, just like it does with human beings as to whether she thinks that's a good uh, opportunity to make. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm looking, are there other questions? And if, if not, maybe we could um, continue on and please um, continue to, write, to put your questions in chat and we'll pause again in about, you know, 10 minutes or so and, and, and have a chance to talk some more. Okay, before. thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so the issue I was uh, pointing to here is homing. And that's a major uh, characteristic of salmon. And the thinking is that they home through a sense of smell when they get to the river mouth. And um, they move up to their natal stream, that is where they were born. It's kind of a interesting miracle. Uh, birds do it um, and uh, turtles and other species as well. It's, um, it's an important thing in terms of uh, reproductive isolation. It creates um, uh, an adaptation to the unique physical and biotic factors in a stream. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very important and it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, this is the the nare, the nose, and this is the brain. And the largest organ in the brain is the olfactory bulb. And that's because they can smell so well and, uh, and have a strong sense of smell. However, there's a small component in the population uh, that do not home. Uh, these are sockeye salmon, red salmon, they call them, surprisingly enough. <laughs> They're all red and beautiful fish as well. Um, and uh, they school up in, and uh, spawn in inlets or outlets of lakes. Um, so they have a different life history. But anyway, a small component in the population stray. It's a form of, it's balanced with homing. <clears throat> it's a form of uh, colonization. Colonization of new habitat. It brings new gene complexes uh, into a population that could be genetically bottlenecked because so few fish may move into a small area, you could begin to have inbreeding. So it's a good thing. It's held in some lower frequency in the population, but it's happening now. It happens in every generation. Natural history right before your eyes. It happened in Lake Merritt. They're colonizing new habitat they're colonizing habitat in the Guadalupe River in San Jose, where I am studying with uh, a, a major nonprofit and uh, looking at uh, how these fish colonize and, uh, and taking samples and studying that. It's also happening in Alaska when the shore fast ice in Alaska melts, it opens up new habitat in the Arctic. And this, these are wild fish now. Wild fish spawn in, in the Arctic. Uh, pink and chum salmon are for the last couple of years are actually spawning in Alaska in the Arctic uh, beyond where they ever were before. So you might ask, uh, how in heaven's name would salmon 
smell the water out in the ocean when they're migrating in the ocean and elaborating all this protein that we talked about generally. Well, it turns out that they're using geomagnetic imprinting. That is to say they're imprinting on the unique magnetic address at the mouth of the stream. Uh, as crazy as that sounds, that's something that birds do also. It's something that uh, turtles do. And, and uh, there, there are examples, many examples uh, of salmon uh, using that. It's been, uh, it's been proposed as a theory for a long time. It's the only thing that really explains how fish get back from the ocean. The other uh, main characteristic is either semoparity or iteroparity, which are big words. Semoparity just means fish die after spawning. And this is kind of a grody carcass, uh, but it's a form of parental care as well, where they bring back this nutrient-rich marine-derived protein from the ocean and deposit it in freshwater systems that aren't as productive. And those nutrients go into solution. They feed um, macroinvertebrates on the bottom. They feed salmon fry. They feed birds like the dipper. Uh, uh, the uh, great blue heron, they f feed uh, raccoons. They've done a study, I think there's a, a hundred species that benefit, including trees, which utilize the marine nitrogen. So it's a, a beautifully adapted system that works with the five Pacific salmon. The other two are iteroparity, that is they they spawn more than once. And um, that is steelhead and sea run cutthroat. So those are the two uh, uh, species that are that differ in this in this regard. Atlantic salmon are are also iteropathic. Uh, and uh, so in any case. Uh, this is an important characteristic um, and uh, helps bring nutrients to these freshwater resources, some of which are so nutrient deficient based on the geochemistry, it's almost like distilled water. Many streams in Alaska, way up in Idaho, uh, in Washington are like that. Um, I would say this is uh, a time, uh, well, right after a couple of slides here real quick. Is that okay, Katie? Great, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, there's a, a, like. <laughs> a number of, of different uh, species here. Uh, pink salmon, they call them humpies, as you can see. Uh, they go to the ocean very excuse me, I'm sorry, very quickly uh, at a small size, uh, 28 millimeters. This is a spawning male on the top and a female on the bottom. And uh, they're only two years of age. So they're even an odd year fish. They don't interbreed. And there's large numbers in Alaska and in Russia uh, of of, uh, of pink salmon. Uh, this is chum salmon. Uh, they also migrate quickly to the ocean. Uh, the adults uh, spend three, four, five years in the ocean. Uh, so they leave as juvenile fish, what we call uh, under yearlings. Uh, they're not a year old. <clears throat> 
They generally spawn in the lower reaches of systems where there's a strong upwelling. And they're also in large numbers in Alaska, Japan, and Russia, and Washington. Uh, Japan has a, a major uh, program with chum salmon, and Alaska does as well. These are sockeye salmon, red salmon. Uh, they require a lake for rearing. They have a very complex life history trait, traits. And um, kokanee is the non-anadromous form. You may have heard of that. They're stocked in lakes. They're found in lakes uh, naturally that are barriered, uh, that weren't barriered at some time in the, in the uh, past. And uh, uh, they're uh, highly prized fish in canned salmon, but also fresh salmon. Copper River salmon in the spring are really high quality fish from Prince William Sound. Coho salmon are all called, also called silver salmon. Um, and they're a, a three-year-old fish and they require a year to 14 months in fresh water. And they're in um, California and all the way up into Alaska. And they've been transported to the Great Lakes. This is uh, Chinook salmon, Oncorhynchus chawicha. Um, so I'll test you on that term after we're done. That's the genus and species. They're king salmon. Uh, a beautiful fish, very complex life history pattern. They're, um, they, uh, are, they enter at different times of year. Every month of the year, uh, originally in the Sacramento probably, and in, uh, in the Klamath, and in uh, the Columbia River, um, and in the Yukon, and the Skagit in, in, uh, in Washington. Um, they're the least abundant of the five species. They're a large fish, black mouth, um, and they're very, very prized, very fine flesh. They get up to 100 pounds in Alaska. Those are seven and eight year fish. Um, so they come in in the, in the winter, the spring, the summer. Uh, uh, so they're very uh, adaptive, very complex fish. These are Brian, steelhead. Brian, do you have a, can you take a couple questions here? Sure. Okay, so um, uh, Brian was asking um, why so many of these species have the bright red color. Uh, have, have the bright red color. Why is bright that? red color? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. They have a bright red flesh as well. Um, this is uh, under hormonal influence, and it's transferring the uh, astaxanthin pigment. Um, and there are. White kings, for instance, and red kings, uh, the, or, or red salmon, or um, Chinook salmon, either red or white, and that's the flesh. And the pigment is astaxanthin that colors the flesh red, as you heard from one of the trivial uh, trivia uh, questions. And if the fish doesn't have the genetic enzyme to deposit astaxanthin in the flesh, they're white. And a white Chinook is highly prized in the market. It costs more money. People think it's higher in oil. But um, I think they've evolved this color pattern to be attractive to the female. So it's a uh, sexual selection uh, a process that is important to salmon and the female and the male, but it may not seem 
important to us, you know, it's one of those things. We, we have, have another, another question, question about um, how far uh, would uh, do salmon, uh, chum salmon particularly, have to swim up um, Sacramento River to reach a suitable area with gravel where they could um, spawn successfully? Well, that varies uh, in terms of a little bit of the species as well as the time of year. So fall Chinook come in in the fall, they spawn in the Guadalupe, Guadalupe River um, as an example in San Jose. So in South San Francisco Bay, so they get they don't get very far up to Sacramento, but they spawn all over the Central Valley. They spawn in um, in Puta Creek up by UC Davis. They spawn in a number of tributaries. They'll spawn immediately inside uh, the estuary and up into a system that drains into the uh, bay if if they're still a habitat. So you have to have the habitat as well. Uh, the point about fall Chinook is they're essentially closer to maturation. Uh, the females are ready, almost ready to ovulate. And so they can't migrate very far anyway. Contrast that with winter Chinook or spring Chinook or summer Chinook. Uh, and uh, those fish, um, certainly spring and summer Chinook, where you have the opportunity and, and no dams blocking their migration, they would come in at that time of year, i.e. in the spring, but they wouldn't spawn until the fall. So they have to live all that time on their resources. Uh, so they come in sexually immature and they'll feed in lake systems or they will feed in uh, river systems. They're found in deep pools. Um, uh, they probably would be in uh, systems uh, like the Tuolumne and, and the upper, upper Sacramento and, and uh, above uh, Lake Shasta in the old days and things like that. It's a good question, thank you. So the next species was steelhead trout, Oncorhynchus micus, and the non-anadromous form is the rainbow trout. And uh, the species is Iteroparis, as we discussed. And they occur all the way down into Southern California, all the way up to the Kuskokwim River in Alaska. Uh, there are beautiful fish, uh, much prized by sportsmen. They're wonderful fish to eat. They're the ecological counterpart of Atlantic salmon. Uh, they require one to two to three years in fresh water. And, and that to a certain extent is their Achilles heel because many of the urban streams and streams in California that are impacted by drought uh, <clears throat> dry up in the summer. So they have to go through at least one summer. Uh, some of the fish leave as under yearling fish if they can grow fast enough, but they have to get to a larger size uh, than pinks and chums. And so um, uh, it's a difficult for them, but they're hanging on in California. And it's surprising, but this fish has the broadest distribution in the ocean, uh, more so than Chinook salmon, which are larger. And swimming speed is a, is a, is a function of body length. So Chinook can swim faster, but these steelhead uh, go way, way out into the ocean and um, they return to rivers to spawn in the spring, summer, winter, and the fall. Uh, they're a tremendous, uh, fascinating fish. It's a coastal cutthroat. Uh, there's just a few in the Eel River system. And then they're all the way up to the Kenai River in Alaska. 
and uh, they reside in streams. They kind of have a similar life history with um, steelhead, but they tend to stay in estuaries and don't migrate all that far. Um, but they're a wonderful fish to catch and people really enjoy them. This is a Masu salmon, much like a coho. They're native only to Asia. Uh, and they're found um, um, in, as a, as a non-anatomous form as well. They spend one year in fresh water. Um, this is the Atlantic salmon, highly prized by sportsmen and is used for, for farming. Uh, they've been transplanted to British Columbia in net pens uh, and in Washington um, in uh, small numbers. They're also now being reared uh, in, uh, in Eureka, California, in, uh, in tanks on, on land. Uh, they, are, uh, uh, they grow very fast in salt water. Uh, they're they're very docile in salt water. They're a wonderful fish to culture in that regard. Um, they're having trouble on the east coast of the United States. Um, they're not as robust as they used to be. They've got lots of problems, but they also have to stay in fresh water for at least a year uh, or two or three. And so that's troublesome when you have drought conditions and, and uh, acid rain and pollution and a number of other problems. Um, we have a question about how the salmon will be affected by global warming. Well, that's a big question, of course, and, um, and a good one. Uh, when we see these major changes in climate and we see drought, like we have in California, they are majorly um, impacted by lack of water, lack of water flow, uh, lack of water in the summer, uh, difficulties associated with that, high temperatures, uh, uh, low, low uh, high temperatures, low dissolved yeah. oxygen. Uh, they have droughts in Alaska too, um, and uh, these are, are problems up there. There's um, a carbon dioxide in in uh, in the ocean. It's a, akin to acid rain they used to have in freshwater in the East Coast. Uh, now we've got dead zones in uh, in the ocean, even in Alaska. Uh, so we, we can get some acidic uh, situations. So uh, one can get uh, depressed by all of this, but salmon are incredibly sustainable and they survive lots of things. Some of uh, uh, the changes in the ocean are, uh, are cycles but global warming doesn't seem to be a cycle. Are there any salmon species that aren't good to eat? <laughs> In my opinion, no. They're all good to eat. Uh, <clears throat> you have to know how to cook them. Um, do not overcook salmon and, uh, and that sort of thing, but they're wonderful wild fish. Farmed fish are good as well. Um, in my opinion, uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings about farmed fish that we can talk about if you'd like. Uh, but um, I think the problem, of course, uh, is if fish are left out and are rancid. So if a fish smells, it's because it's rancid. <clears throat> it's oxidized in the air, and uh, those are not good to eat. So quality control is important. Uh, one of the best detection systems you have is smell. So if the fish smells fishy, 
it's old and isn't good to eat. If you look at fresh fish and smell them, they don't smell at all. And farm fish, for instance, as an example, frozen from Norway at Costco, when you open them up and look and smell them, they don't smell. Interesting. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Bailey. Increases in carbon dioxide emissions are causing uh, global warming and will continue to do so, this is a comment, um, until the levels are reduced. Levels are now 4,414 parts per million and rising by 2.2 .2 per year. This is not a cycle, as you said. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Okay. Yeah, excellent point. Yes. Is there a difference between strays and uh, homers in terms of genetics or egg um, eggs they start from? Well, that's a good question. And um, thank you. Uh, so the fish that we're seeing that are colonizing the Guadalupe, Guadalupe River are false Chinook. And I have a, 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 a scientific collection permit to capture up to 50 carcasses. We've never seen that many in the Guadalupe uh, as carcasses. But um, we take, uh, when we see a missing adipose fin, like one of the fish that you had from uh, Lake Merritt, that is an indication that it has a coated wire tag in the nose. And that will tell you that's a hatchery fish. And then if you uh, take the head and send it to Fish and Game to the coated wire tag laboratory, they will decode it and, um, and tell you what hatchery it comes from and where it was released. So many of these strays are from remote releases in the, in the Sacramento or at the uh, uh, mouth of San Francisco Bay or out in Santa Cruz Harbor. Uh, and uh, the, in Guadalupe River, most of the fish are McCallamy River fish that are marked and they're all remote releases, many of them from San Francisco uh, Bay, um, Fort Ross in that area. But um, uh, what we're looking at is uh, trying to determine the natal origin of the fish as to whether they've spawned in the Guadalupe. And uh, we do that by taking otoliths and by taking eyeballs and the uh, eyeballs are dissected and they look at the lenses at UC Davis <clears throat> in Dr. Um, Rachel Johnson's laboratory at UC Davis. And they use stable isotope analysis, uh, which is a reasonably complicated process and expensive, but it can uh, tell uh, the difference uh, between a hatchery fish in terms of its natal history or a freshwater fish in the stream. And they differ based on the isotope, either sulfur or nitrogen or carbon. Uh, the uh, the uh, isotope has a uh, more concentrated signature because of the marine uh, derived uh, amino acids, hatchery fish are fed marine fish because they bring omega-3 fatty acids and that sort of thing and in the diet and cause them to have better uh, growth and survival. But anyway, it is a different signature than fish that emerge from the gravel and freshwater and eat benthic invertebrates and zooplankton and stuff. They don't have that marine nitrogen signature. So we're, we're learning things every day. There are lots of new things coming out uh, in fisheries and that's what makes it so exciting and so fun to be involved. <laughs> but I wonder if uh, Dr. Ali could tell us what we hear 
in the Lake Merritt area might be able to do from where we are to support salmon and the restoral of their habitat. And well, what, is it something simple we can do from here from our area, the Lake Merritt environs? Um, yeah, it's, it's probably not simple. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, you can see that there are tide gates, so fish are coming into the lake. That's great. And they're also moving up through the lake to the inlet streams. That's great. So th those are good things. What you need to have, of course, is spawning gravel, quality spawning gravel in those uh, inlet streams or, um, and uh, for one, then you have to have the water quality to support uh, reasonably good oxygen saturations. And um, you have to have uh, a temperature regime that's suitable um, for incubation. Uh, it shouldn't. It should be below 56 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, and for rearing, it can be warmer. But then you get into the problem with. Um, uh, temperature and so the relationship between temperature and and dissolved oxygen is inverse so the higher the temperature in the spring and summer the lower the oxygen and what turns out to be a kind of a unique adaptation is fall chinook only require staying in the freshwater for the these are the fish that are coming into lake merritt for uh, <clears throat> a couple of months. So they can leave before the system warms up. Um, but there are a number of things uh, that are certainly required. Um, you'd have to have access upstream to the spawning gravel. You'd have to ac have access downstream so that the young fish we call smolts can go to the ocean. We want to note um, that this is the um, fifth anniversary of the closure of the Rotary Nature Center building. And we're hoping for a brighter future for an interpretive center here at Lake Merritt. Um, we really appreciate the support that we receive from people. If you would like to make a donation, um, you could send a donation to this location and this will be repeated in our post chat um, email to everyone who's here. Um, we want to thank our producer, uh, Rob Lamone, and our um, members of the Lake Merritt, of the Lake Merritt uh, Rotary Nature Center Friends Group. Uh, we want to thank um, Lake Merritt Institute and the San Francisco Elks Lodge for a generous donation. Um, we have generous donations from individuals and all of these um, gifts help us to provide um, our lakeside chats and also stewardship activities um, with the local people, especially young people hooked up during the um, pandemic. Um, our program is rebroadcast on um, the city of Oakland um, TV station, Cape Top um, TV. And you can go to uh, www.oaklandcalifornia.gov to find out when it is, um, how to reach uh, the program. Thank you to our volunteers, program participants, and partners. And thank you so much for coming. Um, in April, we are going to have a wonderful um, presentation, a virtual um, bird walk with Hillary Powers. Yeah. Be joining us again for that. And after that, we have a, um, in May, we're going to have a presentation on turtles, on the, mm -hmm. uh, the Western pond turtle, um, and also by on um, um, sea turtles in Baja with um, uh, Billy Tu, an Oakland a native who studied um, the uh, pond turtles and uh, Paris organist who is a employee of Lake Merritt Institute who studies um, and helps conserve uh, sea turtles in Baja. And so I um, want to thank you. Our mission is to support um, a better um, appreciation and connection with um, nature through all of these activities. 
And I think that is uh, the end of my slides. Every, um, we want to let everybody know that there are opportunities to help clean the lake locally. And uh, Rotary Nature Center Friends is out every third Saturday to do stewardship activities, often um, tending our salt marsh uh, restoration area that we have and also the Rotary Nature Center grounds. So at this point, I want to thank everybody and we're going to reopen. Uh, I'm gonna stop my screen share and we'd like to reopen. Brian, do you think we can get back to where you were? <laughs> um, so uh, we do have some good questions in the chat um, and I can ask them while we, um, right now, actually we don't even need the presentation before us, but, um, um, Jerry Lips asked um, to say so if you could say something about the um, what species are used in aquaculture in Chile and have there been problems with their escape into the wild? Is this an ecological problem? And um, we had another good question. Um, what are the temperatures in Guadalupe Creek where you're studying the salmon there? How do their conditions look um, looking at those abiotic factors? So uh, we are going to unmute people so that you can speak if you raise your hand during this um, next portion. So um, that would be great, we'll do that. And um, so um, Dr. Lee, can you say something about the aquaculture situation and problems of escape, especially in uh, Chile? Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> Chile is a unique place uh, for aquaculture. Uh, uh, they, uh, some of the operations raise uh, Atlantic salmon and uh, coho salmon in lakes. Uh, they, they raise rainbow trout as well. Uh, and then they transfer them to salt water and um, in a net pen program, a number of Norwegian companies are there. Uh, it's kind of like corporate farming. Uh, there are not a lot of um, so-called mom and pop programs down there, uh, smaller uh, landowners. There were, but most of them have been acquired. Uh, they have unique conditions. Uh, somewhat like Norway, and uh, they have rich plankton, they have excellent water quality and uh, temperature regime, uh, warm, warmer water comes up along the coast um, uh, from Tierra del Fuego, and uh, they have good growth. Um, they're in net pens. They've had problems with uh, certain diseases and uh, uh, they have, um, uh, these are transplanted fish, Atlantic salmon and Oncorhynchus species like Chinook and Coho. Oncorhynchus Kasuch is the Coho, and Oncorhynchus Chawicha is the Chinook. Uh, there are Chinook that are in uh, freshwater streams. They're supporting a big um, uh, sport fishery. Uh, they've escaped um, perhaps from net pens, but uh, all the Norwegian farmers prefer Atlantic salmon uh, for farming. Uh, but the, uh, during the Peace Corps in Chile, when I was at the University of Washington in graduate school, they were very active in transplanting Washington uh, uh, species, eyed eggs, uh, juveniles, uh, down to Chile uh, from the Washington Department of Fisheries and from the University of Washington hatchery. And that hatchery has produced most of the successful um, 
uh, fish, the genetics of that particular hatchery. Dr. Lauren uh, Donaldson is a famous ichthyologist from the University of Washington. And the Peace Corps thought that program was a failure. And so for 40 years, they never saw any fish. And now they're contributing in Argentina as well as, um, as, as Chile. Um, the farm salmon industry down there has had to learn to separate the pens, to follow best management practices, which they weren't doing at first. Um, and uh, uh, they have to work with disease-free fish, which requires a hatchery as a disease-free water source. Uh, and it's pretty complicated, uh, certainly, but it is interesting. They have large volumes of fish. Uh, the Norwegians probably have uh, the best fish and quality. Uh, they're being raised in British Columbia. They're being raised in Ireland and England and Scotland uh, and New Zealand. And uh, it, one thing that's interesting about colonizing is uh, these fish were, have been, you know, rainbow trout have been transplanted everywhere. Um, um, and brown trout, number of species, sockeye salmon, salmon, but Sacramento Chinook salmon were transferred to New Zealand uh, as uh, fall Chinook and they did very well and they developed spring, summer and fall Chinook as I understand it. So they've evolved <clears throat> to that habitat. And of course the equator is a thermal barrier and fish couldn't immigrate <clears throat> in that system or colonize uh, because of the thermal barrier. <clears throat> so they flew them in <laughs> and uh, a lot of people or some people don't, I, I'm sure uh, don't like that sort of thing, but <clears throat> it's been done all over the world, doesn't justify it. Um, the uh, Chinook from Washington State, as well as coho, as well as pinks and chums, uh, as well as steelhead were transferred into Lake Michigan. And uh, they support and have supported a very strong sport fishery. So those folks seem to like that kind of thing. Um, and it brings revenue, economic development. Generally, that's one of the motivations uh, behind all of this. Anyway, um, thank you for the question. And, and then I, I, I think I've forgotten the other one. <laughs> um, Was that about? Uh, hold on. Um, meanwhile, um, David has his hand raised and I'll find the other question. Okay. Yes. Okay, then I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead then. Um, thank you. My question is: uh, Is there a specific date and time that we could mark as the uh, sort of the the beginning of this type of international fisheries and hatchery kind of uh, operations, like we see the Norwegians doing, or is it something simply that humans have done forever? <laughs> That's a complicated question and a very good one. Um, um, generally speaking, um, aquaculture is not viewed, salmon aquaculture, excuse me, is not viewed very highly um, by sport fishermen, commercial fishermen uh, um, up and down the West Coast. Aquaculture farming salmon is banned in Alaska. It's illegal. <clears throat> it's allowed. Um, aquaculture is allowed in British Columbia. There's a, one site left in Washington. Uh, there's 
and there are some uh, sites that are raising salmon in freshwater uh, in Washington. Uh, there are some steelhead that are being reared in the Columbia River uh, on the Washington side, generally not much in Oregon, but there is this farm in Eureka uh, that is um, using recycled technology and salt water, a large energy inputs and it's complicated, but it's feasible and it's being done and recycle hatcheries have been uh, involved in this for a long time um, and such. Uh, what you have to have if you're going to do that sort of thing is an excellent freshwater source um, uh, and or uh, uh, pumped salt water. I, I, I was inaccurate when I said salt water ponds in Eureka. I think they can use salt water as well. Um, at the old pulp and paper mill, but they have an allocation of fresh water that they, when they bought out the uh, site, uh, they received that, I gather. And so they have fresh water. So it is expensive uh, in that regard for just putting in a regular hatchery as I understand it, they had one at a rainbow trout in Lake Merritt somewhere at one time. That's true. There, there was a planned uh, rainbow trout or um, steelhead hatchery that was planned to create a, um, you know, some sports fisheries and opportunities for kids to learn how to fish and whatever, but it just never got off the ground. Um, so, um, well, listen, I, I apologize, but I'd like to clarify my question. Oh, yeah. um, Oh, sure. And I just wanted to say that um, not that okay. we would particularly uh, want that because we've had a lot of problems with fishing a gear causing damage to wildlife in Lake Merritt. So go ahead, David. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm really curious as to whether or not uh, a person arriving here in California in 1848 or 1849 uh, with everyone else uh, when they were at Eureka and in the San Francisco Bay. Would they look and say, oh, look at all these fish. Let me start catching them and serving the population. Or would it occur to them, oh, look at all this. I need to create a fishery or a hatchery. Or, and uh, were they, was it already possible to be thinking in those terms of creating fisheries and hatcheries at that time? Or would a person just sort of help themselves to the abundance that they found? Well, um, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question, kind of complicated as well, but um, most of the fish in the Columbia, um, in the Sacramento are hatchery fish. And uh, it's because <laughs> mankind um, hasn't taken very good care of the watershed and we have water rights that are allocated to senior water right holders, junior water right holders. Many people jumped on this in the 1800s or early 1900s. And so we have this system that kind of left out water for fish. And uh, it's, um, there are, there are modeling exercises that are used to identify the amount of water you need for fish. But in many cases, there are, and in California, they're over allocated, clearly. And we have a drought and farming is a wonderful thing for California. It's a major generator of income and such, um, but <laughs> we, um, 
we have difficulties with the aquifers and groundwater and surface water. And uh, now we're going into major droughts and global warming. And so it's, it's pretty tough. Even the hatcheries are having trouble. So they're releasing fish into the river or these release sites, but they're not imprinting the fish for a period of time. The best management practice is a couple of weeks where you can feed them and they equilibrate to the salt and they require energy to do that. <clears throat> and so you can feed them and stuff, but uh, what's happening is they're not imprinting the fish. And so the fish stray or they don't contribute to the fishery in the way they could. So in Alaska, there are rules about that. And uh, two weeks is the minimum imprinting time. And then you can, believe it or not, fish can be imprinted in freshwater, saltwater, brackish water estuaries. And so you can put a saltwater pen in Prince William Sound in a bay and fishermen can come and fish there or in Homer, Alaska on the Kenai Peninsula in the, what is called the Homer Spit where they've developed hotels and uh, fishing areas and restaurants. And there's a little dugout area and the Chinook salmon come right back to that. They're imprinted and they catch them hook and line. So there's things that can be done. Um, hopefully that didn't get too far afield for your question. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, just um, this I've been puzzling about for a while. Why are there so many species um, in the Pacific um, in terms of salmon compared to the Atlantic? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I wonder if it has anything to do with the, you know, the geology of the situation, the, um, you know, the activity, you know, uplifting, the, you know, the conversion plates and all that ca causing a lot of um, different... It, pro it probably has a lot to do with all of that. It, it's... You know, it's, it's so complicated, really, that there's so many limiting factors on fish populations to survive. It's freshwater, it's estuarine, it's the ocean. Atlantic salmon on the East Coast have been impacted by uh, the fishery at sea off of Greenland and those areas where the fish go. Um, they found higher catch rates and things. It's, it's been difficult, I think, to manage them between all the various states that are fishing uh, beyond the 200 mile limit. And, um, uh, you know, difficulties like that. So it's not only fishing, it's, it's the habitat. And, uh, the opportunity for the fish in the first place um, to evolve in those areas uh, could have had a lot to do with the ice sheets uh, that occurred um, during the last police, the Pleistocene era and stuff. So that's... <laughs> Thank you. It's just clear to me that we could learn a lot uh, from salmon. <laughs> There's so many... Uh, biological questions and, and do, do, do you see uh, Jerry's question here about whether or not uh, there were any salmon uh, bones found in the Ohlone Shell Mounds? Good question. I'm sorry, I'm sort of a little bit hard of hearing, so I think I missed you. Do you know if there were any um, salmon bones found in the uh, any of the Ohlone Shell Mounds as a part of their practice? There, there were, uh, there's a paper out um, on that in, in terms of historic 
um, bones that were found, uh, vertebral bones, um, and they they found near the Guadalupe River, <clears throat> uh, there were Chinook salmon that were identified uh, by some sophisticated methods. Um, um, Dr. Landman is the senior author. I'm one of the junior authors, but but anyway, um, uh, yeah, and and you do see that up and down the coast. Um, so so that's an interesting question that you're you're asking. Were were salmon here before? Uh, all of the population growth and movement into this area. And I'm sure they were. Uh, Leidy has done some work, survey work. Um, um, University of California has, as well as Stanford in the old, old biologists, and they've looked at some of these watersheds and uh, they've seen when uh, when they were alive and, and collecting samples um, back in the 1800s and stuff um, and doing what we call hip boot and waiter biology, which is kind of fun stuff. <laughs> now it's pretty sophisticated, but uh, they, they found species in a number of these systems. And if they didn't at that time, it, there, there could be a, a couple of different reasons for it, but um, you know all the things that have happened to these little tributaries like Glen Echo Creek um, before the before all the urbanization um, probably had spawning gravel, probably had rainbow trout in the system, indigenous fish um, could well have, and if they did, could well have uh, coho and Chinook or the possibility exists that they could. Um, well, th thank you. I'd like to share a comment with everybody from Dick uh, Bailey. Habitat variation drives diversity in species. So perhaps there are more diverse habitats in the Pacific versus the Atlantic in terms of the earlier question about, uh, about why there may be so many different species that we find in the Pacific versus the Atlantic of salmon. So the whole uh, habitat variation driving diversity in species, but you know, I also heard that they were uh, that they were waiting on the Panama Canal initially, huh. so that they can get back and forth uh, yeah. from Pacific <laughs> to Atlantic. Yeah, yeah. I want to. So we're at the end of our hour, and um, thank you so much for talking to us for so long and and answering all of our diverse questions. Um, everybody, please continue to ask questions, and um, when I send out the recording and uh, post Zoom information, I can probably put in um, some of the uh, references that have been mentioned here tonight. Um, it's such a rich topic um, and I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for, for coming and being our featured speaker. It's just been really great. Um, Thank you so very much for the opportunity. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Sorry I went over too. <laughs> Perhaps, but it was interesting wonderful. topic so to me. To certainly, so much to say. <laughs> I, I can't wait to hear what you find out in the South Bay. I'm thinking that's that's just a really exciting research. Thank we you. certainly thank you for uh, spending this time with us. Absolutely, my pleasure. We had a quick question about the temperatures in the um, in the Guadalupe Creek compared to Glen Echo. Oh yeah, so the Guadalupe dries up in the summer. Uh, in, in spots. Um, Los Gratis Creek is where we get most of the spawning. It dries up. The habitat 
in many cases, there are not enough riffle and pool habitat. The riffles, the uh, shallow areas that are flowing fast, that's where the macroinvertebrates grow. So that's, well, that's where the algae grows. That's where the macroinvertebrates that the fish eat are. And uh, so you have to have riffles, but you have to have pools for rearing. And so there's, they're deficient in that regard. It's constrained by the reservoir. Uh, so steelhead are way up in the watershed. They're hanging on by their fins, so to speak. And uh, spring Chinook or uh, summer Chinook, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fall Chinook are so well adapted because they leave as juvenile fish after a couple of months. So the temperature goes up uh, with air temperature and it's too high after May, June, July, that kind of thing. And so the, the fall Chinook are already gone as juveniles and they're in the estuary. And the estuary is very critical to uh, uh, Chinook. So the temperatures uh, in the winter can go below uh, 56 for incubation. Uh, it can get above uh, into the 70s, which is a little too high. But they found that um, if you're in an area that has rich food abundance, then the fish can immigrate like steelhead as under yearling fish. They'll grow fast if there's food av available and the oxygen levels are not terribly poor. So there's some temperature refugia also in the Guadalupe <clears throat> uh, underground. Uh, these aquifers are upwelling. Uh, that's the way it's always been there. So they build apartment houses and freeways over it and they have to pump the water out of the basements of these systems. And it goes down into the Guadalupe below, right about the airport. And there's some good temperature regimes down there we found. So that's kind of fascinating. Um, so there's other things to be thankful for. Uh, the, the, some complexities, you know, um, with the Guadalupe, but and there may be with regard to, uh, to uh, Glen Echo Creek uh, as, a, as a tributary. And so the help with the students and the water quality and the seasonal sampling uh, is really critical and important. Uh, and so I would advocate for doing more of that. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. I think it is time for us to wrap it up. And thank you so much for your, your time with us tonight. Um, you know, it's really great when people interested in nature get together. And um, it's been a great, great time tonight. Please come to our Lakeside Chat um, in April on April 1st. <laughs> and uh, we usually go the first Friday of the month. We'll send you information about that. So thank, thank you. you so much. Katie, you also yes. have, a, have a nice thank evening. Uh, well, Mr. So Mr. Brian, before you go, I have a big announcement to make. Oh. I've given this a lot of thought and um, I'm gonna take the cue from the salmon and uh, I'm gonna make a sacrifice in order to uh, help humanity take the next step forward in its evolution. I've decided to return to the symbiotic fluid that I was spawned in. And I'm going to swim upstream and, and then spawn again. But so uh, we'll we'll move humanity forward. <laughs> Thank you for that parting thought. <laughs> Thank God you. God bless you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, everyone. Okay. We'll see you later. Good night. Hey, good night, bye -bye. everyone. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lee. Thank you, everybody. You're okay. welcome. Good night. <laughs>